I was working on a project in 2010. It was a chain of language schools and we were building some software to help people learn remotely outside of their classes. And we kind of defined a whole bunch of different online activities to build. And instead of doing it in an iterative, incremental way, we just were working on everything. I think nine different activities to all release at the same time. And we got about a month away from the launch date and funding for the project was cut completely. And we were so close to getting it out there. And then in the end, nothing was able to be released so no learners ever saw all of this stuff that we were working on and it just felt so sad and disappointed that all of that work that we'd done then didn't ever see the light of day and at the time I didn't think I wish we'd use Agile but then it was kind of after that reflecting on it and Agile was kind of gaining in popularity and then I thought back to that experience and how different that would have been if we had said let's just build one activity and get it out there and see what people think of it and learn from that and then we'll build the second one. Welcome to another episode of Adventures in Learning Design, a series of conversations about ideas, principles, research and practice, exploring how we can make learning more effective and more enjoyable, whether that's in the workplace, at school, at university or at home. My name's Laurie Harrison. And my name is Tim Gifford. And we're both co-founders of LearnJam, a digital learning agency and consultancy. Episode 11, Agile. In this episode, Tim and I spoke to Joe Sayers, one of the directors of LearnJam. We've known Joe since 2013, and at that time, Joe was working at Busu, which is one of the biggest language learning apps in the world. Joe joined us a year later as our head of product, and since then, he's specialized in the development of digital learning products, developed using the Agile methodology. That means developing in short, iterative cycles or sprints, as opposed to waterfall, which is the more traditional approach to product development where all of the specifications and requirements are worked out in detail up front and then delivered. We found that in the field of learning design and in the development of learning products and solutions, Agile has been the more effective of the two approaches and it's the one that we typically recommend. So we thought it would be great to have a chat with Joe, who is our in-house expert on this way of working, to find out a bit more about his approach to using Agile on learning projects and to see what advice he has for anyone looking to find out more about Agile and how it can be put into practice. We're joined by Joe Sayers, co-founder and head of product at LearnJam. Laurie, I don't know if you've met Joe before. I think I have. <laughs> Once I'm looking at, looking at him now on the Zoom call and he does look vaguely familiar. Joe, it's wonderful to have you here, man. Welcome. Thank to you. The, Thanks the, very much. Podcast. It's great to have your voice in the conversation. Happy Thanks. New Year to you. Happy New Year. I've been practicing yeah. my uh, podcasting voice, especially. It sounds great. Excellent. Does yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sound like you've been doing it for years, Joe. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what I mostly did over my couple of weeks off. <laughs> Time well spent. Joe, we've got us all together to talk about Agile in learning design, something that we've been using as an organisation for several years now, but we thought it was worth a conversation about what it is, how we use it and why we use it, and something that has particular relevance, I suppose, in the products that we develop. Um, mm. Something that as head of product you've been very well embedded in. So I guess I'm, I'm just going to start, just going to throw it on the table, start of a 10, just unbox this. Joe, what in the earth is Agile? What do we mean by it? It's an approach to developing something, I guess traditionally developing software, but it's often maybe quite helpfully described in contrast to what it's not, which is a kind of more traditional waterfall approach to project management. So Agile is a more iterative approach where requirements can emerge out of the the work that you're doing rather than needing to be all defined at the beginning. And through that process, you get cumulative usable outcomes or products that have some some value, some usability. So rather than an approach where you're um, sort of waiting till the end to get something that's usable, you, you, you try to create something usable as quickly as possible and then start to, to build 
on that as you as you work through. Is that an yeah. okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll run with that. Yeah, we I can run with well, that. Yeah. I, I would just add also that another sort of key principle of agile is around empowering the team. Mm, yes. So the people who are actually doing the thing rather mm-hmm. than managers or project managers, the people who are going to build the software or write the content of trying to push as much of the decision-making authority down the chain to those people as possible, I think is another mm. really important principle of Agile. Sometimes descriptions of Agile can seem a bit abstract, so we wanted to find out more about what it really looks like in practice. So Joe, can you kind of paint us a picture? What does it look like? typical week? What are the sorts of activities, tasks, behaviours that go into running an Agile project? Yeah, so actually it might be useful at this point just to say that, so Agile is a set of principles. I think they were put out into the world 20 years ago, so 2001. And there are a couple of different ways that you can, or a couple of different approaches to follow these principles. So one of those and the one that we use most regularly is Scrum, but there are there are others. Kanban is one, and I'm, I'm sure there may, may be others as well. As I describe what a kind of typical product development process might look like, I think what I'm describing actually is, a, is broadly a, a scrum approach. But it's also maybe worth mentioning that there is some variation, so it might look different across different projects. And I think it will depend as well on, on who we're working with and how much understanding of or interest in Agile there is from, from the different clients or partners or organisations that we're working with. But with that caveat, <laughs> um, I guess a, a kind of traditional or sort of a typical look at a week or a fortnight might be that we chunk our time into sprints and that might be a one week sprint or a two week sprint and the idea is that you have a backlog of things that you would like to do as a, as a team of developers or a team of learning designers or whoever might whoever might be on that team you have a list of things that you would like to do things that will deliver some value to our clients or to or to their learners and they're generally just described as user stories. So you'll have a backlog of user stories and this and the story will describe who you would be doing this thing for, uh, what the feature is that you would be doing for them and, and, and why. So as a, a learner using this product, I would like to be able to save the bits of content that really interest me so that I can come back to them easily and quickly in the, in the future. That might be an example of a user story. So in a, in a project, you would, you would have a, a list of user stories in, in a backlog and then every sprint, whether that be one or two weeks, you would decide which of these user stories to commit to in, in that sprint. So actually something that we've started doing recently is thinking of the backlog as a wish list and the sprint as a commitment. So you have a wish list of things that you that you know might never get done, actually. Um, mm-hmm. But that each week or two weeks, you um, somehow as a team or somebody in the team makes a decision about what we commit to in that time frame. And then the team can work collaboratively, creatively to deliver on that value. The idea being that at the end of that cycle, you have something that you can show. So it doesn't sort of sit there in the background, but that actually you you can put it out there into the world. And whether that's to a user or just to the client, you can demonstrate the output of that period of time of that sprint. So it's clear that this idea of a backlog of features or pieces of value to create is really key to the Agile process. Let's find out a bit more about what makes for a good backlog and how to manage that. So that backlog, that could be a collection of all the ideas that we've had for features of a product, for example, or for pieces of content. Here's all the stuff that we we think we might want to do, all the pieces of value that we might want to create for the, the learner or the end user of whatever we're, we're yeah. putting together. Or, or the client, you can sometimes describe mm. it in terms of the client as well. So what do they need in terms of analytics or in terms mm. of an element of that product or that learner experience that needs to map with something else that they're already doing or some other product that they have. So it sometimes would be described in terms of the end user learner, but sometimes that user story is, is actually the client or somebody within the client organisation. On a good learning project, mm. where would you want that backlog to come from? What would be the source of that? Well, I think there's various inputs, I suppose. Mm. So some would be client requirements, 
but some, and ideally most of the learner-facing ones, should come from some understanding of that learner through interviews, personas that you build and develop over time, and some understanding of that learner and that problem space so that you can then, with confidence, say, as a user, as a learner, I want this thing. And it's not just you sort of sat separately from them deciding what it is that they want, but you've got some evidence mm-hmm. to, to, to demonstrate that that's, that's actually helpful for them. When we talk about, you know, we, we favour or we, we advocate a learner-centred approach mm. to learning design, I think that's at the heart of that, isn't it? That what that means in reality is that that backlog of items the, and features and content and so on that we want to create is primarily driven by our understanding of who the learners are through talking mm. to them, deeply understanding what problems they're trying to solve, what their motivations are, rather than just like, here's a spec, go and build it. Mm. And I think it gives you more opportunity with that approach to say, this is our current understanding of what those learners want, the evidence that we have for this being what they want, but also the realisation that you will build that understanding as you go, rather than needing to have all of that understanding at the beginning, define everything and then spend three months or a year or whatever it is building it without actually being able to validate that and get some feedback that says oh okay well we were right about these things but actually turns out we were wrong about those um so that process gives us an opportunity to build user stories based on that user-centered approach and that understanding but realize that that will inevitably be a kind of incomplete picture Mm. that you then update as you go through the development process i think that's a really important thing isn't it that that backlog of user stories is a is a a living Mm. (laughs) dynamic constantly changing thing or it should be on a a good agile project i guess a danger is that you could start with good intentions and create an initial backlog based on an understanding of learners and talking to them and then that just gets set in stone Mm. by definition almost your project is no longer agile you know even if you're working in sprints and doing all the other agile or scrum rituals mm-hmm. but if, if you don't treat that as a dynamic thing that is responding to what you're learning as you go mm-hmm. then really you've just defined your product up front and yeah. then you're just putting your head down and and building it next up we wanted to talk a bit more about user stories and what makes for a good user story so so we've got this concept of the of the backlogs, this is our, our kind of initial wish list of features and, and content elements that will make up this product expressed as user stories, which you, you kind of defined mm. a few minutes ago. The user story as a concept is pretty critical because that's this is how we're defining all the different elements of the learning experience or product that we're creating. Mm. So you gave a nice example earlier, but in your mind, what constitutes a, a good user story versus a a poor user story or a badly expressed user story? Are there any kind mm. of key differentiators or tips? So I think it definitely shouldn't feel like a task. It shouldn't feel like you are writing a task for the mm. for the development team, like, you know, build this thing mm-hmm. <laughs> or develop yeah. that feature. So that format of specifying the user, the feature, and then the value to them helps you sort of frame it in terms of of that value to them rather than what you as a group mm. are doing. But And that's kind of got two benefits. One is that it, it does describe that value. So you're thinking about them and what they need and, you know, what their context is and so on. But also it allows for creativity in how you actually implement that. Um, so you're not specifying we will build a feature that does this. You're saying as a learner, I need this value and then the team can say, well, one way of doing that would be this and another way of doing that mm. would be that. And then you can you can decide together what you think, you know, creatively using your experience, mm. team experience. And as you mentioned before, Laurie, this, this sort of self-organizing or cross-functional team who can then collaborate on, on different ideas to deliver that mm. value. So I think that's one thing. But also it's useful if in time that you can break those stories down to their ideally smallest or small constituent parts. Um, mm. Because it might not be that the entire thing is a sort of bigger picture user story is actually uh, a priority in its entirety so that makes it difficult when you're prioritizing what to work on within that backlog if if you've defined a user story really broadly it may get moved across and then if if it were to get moved across into a sprint and then get broken down you could realize that actually only three quarters of this is actually really important for us to do and the other stuff doesn't need to be in this sprint so we're effectively wasting our time on it so in the backlog if you can break it down and this is something that can happen over time Uh, it shouldn't Mm -hmm. kind of stop you from putting something in there but as a team you might realize that this story could be broken down into a number of smaller stories and then those can be prioritized can we think of an example of that just to kind of make that more concrete sort of a fairly big 
user story and then how that might break down. So let's say it might be like, uh, you know, as a learner, I want to track my progress so that I can see that I'm improving or something. Mm. Okay, well, that that is true. And I, I think that, that there are lots of ways that you could do that. But bringing that in to a sprint in its entirety feels like it would be too much work or there are too many yeah. options there or there's not enough clarity on what that really means for that to be brought into a, a, a sprint that you're committing to. So I think you'd break that down and you might then do some work to think, okay, well, at what points in that learner's journey would indicating or demonstrating progress be helpful and why and what are the different kind of options for where that could come into the user journey and then you might break that down so for example it might be after doing an initial placement test or something I'd like to get uh, an understanding of where I did well and where I didn't do so well and so that I can understand where I'm being placed in the course or Mm -hmm. something like that that would be a demonstration of progress but a much more specific one than than how it was worded at the beginning and then that would help the development team to say okay well then let's do that in this way Um, and then there'll be other points in the user journey where they might want to also see their progress but that might be, be in a a different way or for a different purpose. Hopefully we're starting to get a good picture of what Agile is about and some of the things that are important to make it work. But what's this got to do with learning? So the question I've got is, why do we as a digital learning design agency apply Agile methodology? Like, Why do we feel that 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 methodology helps us create or develop more effective learning product. Yeah, there's a few sort of theoretical reasons, but I guess we probably all have other, maybe more like personal stories of where we've seen it work well or not work well. But I think the theoretical reason or the or justification is it's really risky to define everything up front and assume that you were correct enough <laughs> that it's okay to then spend a, a long chunk of time, three months, six months, a year or whatever, developing that without having opportunities to get feedback and respond to emerging requirements. So I think you, mm. you, the longer that you work on something without putting it in front of a learner, the, the more risk you you accumulate in that process. By working through this approach, you you, re, you maybe remove a little bit of the pressure up front to get everything right and everything mm. defined because you you will always get something wrong and you, or there will always be some, some something missing or some inaccuracies there. So this allows you to say, let's understand these learners as well as we can. Let's define uh, what we think is needed and let's keep on checking that and keep on uh, b- building things, building these cumulative usable elements of the product Mm. that allow us to then move in a direction that can kind of emerge as we go rather than setting everything in stone up front. Mm. I think that was my experience thinking back 10 years now to when I started working in educational publishing, creating learning products, was that we were creating courses, both print and digital, with development times, lead-in times of years, Mm. with no involvement from the learners at all. Um, Mm. which seemed quite normal at the time. But actually, when you think about it, like a a three-year course development cycle, so much happens in three years, Mm -hmm. (laughs) culturally, technologically, all of this stuff, it it changes so quickly that, you know, by by the time you've got something to publish or release, like the world is a different place. And the learners that you had in your mind are in a very different state of their mm. their learning sort of journeys and life stages and so on. So that involvement of learners at every stage really is like, I see as being a critical benefit, I suppose, to using mm. Agile. You're always yeah. developing something that is delivering optimum value to the end user. Or you, and you're identifying where it isn't so that you, yeah. you can improve on that uh, and sort of acknowledging that there will be opportunities to optimise always. No, I totally agree. And that, that leads me to the kind of the second benefit as I, as I see it in my experience and how I see it working with us as an organisation is that it turns us, the, the company, the agency that uses Agile into a learning organisation itself. Like mm. we need to be learning about what our product needs to do all the time. Like, where can we improve? Where are we making assumptions that aren't valid? How might we do something differently? So for me, it's like it's a mark of a successful use of Agile is that you as an organisation are learning something all the time about mm. what you should and shouldn't be doing, can or can't do. And again, going back to sort of the previous state 10 years ago, like there was no learning happening about what that product mm. could, should and would do. It's just kind of this really weird sort of stagnant way of looking at product development. Yeah, that's interesting, actually, because if you're not doing it in Agile, then you're just you're, you're developing or you're producing something, but you're not actually learning much yeah. 
Uh, yeah. over the course of that so actually it's kind of it's quite nicely fitting that it works well for us as a learning organization because Absolutely. it kind of has learning at its yeah. core yeah another thought that just sparked in my mind is agile is very often associated with lean mm. uh, which you know initially comes from lean manufacturing and Toyota mm. and all that kind of stuff but the, the concept of maximizing the amount of work not done which I really like and, and big and fan of for me yeah big fan <laughs> of that, uh, <laughs> in every aspect of my life <laughs> um, but I think it's a, that that also for me is a key part of a good agile project is that's what you're seeking to do and that there should be if you're implementing agile well pretty significant gains there in terms of efficiency and effectiveness of a, of a project because in the I guess the more traditional waterfall approach where you're putting huge amounts of effort at the start into defining in complete detail everything that you're going to do and then put your head down for a year or two and develop it. First of all, a lot of that effort may be wasted mm. if it turns out you were developing the wrong thing. Whereas with Agile, if you're working in short sprints and you've got this dynamic, constantly updating backlog of prioritised user stories that you're working through you have the opportunity to correct course mm. Mm. every couple of weeks mm. and therefore you're much less likely to spend months going down a cul-de-sac developing the wrong thing that is helping you to maximize the amount of work not done or, or work not wasted i guess mm -hmm. also from bitter personal experience like tim i used to work in educational publishing i spent a lot of time writing and reading very long documents um, so product specification documents, technical specification documents, 50, 100 page docs that, that took weeks to put together by teams of people, which were designed to set out in detail every single detail of a product before anything had, ha had happened, before we'd broken ground on developing mm. it. That in itself is a, a huge amount of work that in a good agile project actually doesn't get done because yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not needed. If you have a an empowered cross-functional team who are making the decisions about, like you said, Joe, earlier, but sort of bringing their creativity and their ideas to the table every sprint to mm. think about, okay, how should we develop this feature? You know, what should we do with this user story? That takes away the need for that over-extensive documentation, which in itself takes a lot of time and effort to create. Mm. So that, for me, is also one of the big benefits of Agile is less time documenting and more time actually creating stuff that's valuable. That was one of the core tenets of the yeah, Agile was, manifesto we, we value 20 years ago, whatever. Functioning yeah. software over documentation. So Agile sounds fantastic. It gives us a more learner-centered approach. It reduces risk. It empowers the team. It leads to more value being created. But sometimes Agile isn't the right approach. And in other instances, it's quite hard to persuade people of the value of Agile, even if it might be the better approach. But I think that's where a lot of the discomfort comes mm. f within organizations when it comes to considering Agile over a waterfall approach, like the uncertainty or the discomfort around, well, what exactly are we going to be ending up with? Mm. Like mm. there's still very much I see a insistence, very strong preference to being really clear on like, tell me what I'm going to get <laughs> yeah. before we start. <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah, okay, I mean, we can't. But like, what we can say is that what you're going to get is going to be the most valuable outcome for you and your learners. Like what mm. exactly that looks like, we don't know. And mm. Personally, I find the most exciting point is finding out as you go through mm. like what it's going to be. But yeah, there's that sort of discomfort, isn't there, around, well, unless I know exactly what I'm getting, it's hard to commit to it fully. Uh, and often to get budget signed mm, off and sort exactly. of more logistical things within an organisation as well. And I think sometimes we, we find that partners or clients will say like, yeah, yeah, we're, we're on board with Agile, but also tell us what, we, <laughs> what we're going to yeah. have at, at the end of it. And yeah. I think... You can, you know, there's there's ways of, of kind of navigating that and say, you know, we're aiming. This is where we're aiming for. This is our current hypothesis as to what we're going to finish with. But along the way, if we have evidence to suggest that that isn't right anymore, then we are working in it with an approach that allows us to change change course. That's sometimes quite helpful. But I think as well, they do 
any anybody who works with us or any team implementing an agile methodology needs to really trust that team because mm. you're buying their their time spent on something you're not buying a fixed output you're saying mm. we we will pay for you to spend each sprint with this many people in your team working in pursuit of this but without yeah without them having definition up front of exactly what they're going to have so if they don't if they're not on board with that approach or if they don't really trust that you're the right team to do that then that's i think mm. where sometimes it can, it can cause difficult conversations up front in a project mm. yeah it's a, it's a it is a challenge and i think maybe it's worth calling out that there are different types of projects as well so there are mm. ones where okay we've done this before <laughs> we're doing this again and there's other ones where well we've never done this before and we don't know yeah. exactly what's going to work and in that first instance sometimes a waterfall approach can work for sure and maybe preferable yeah yeah exactly whereas in the second second instance if you've never done this before and you, you, you're not 100 percent sure what's going to work in my experience almost always it will go over budget and over time mm-hmm. <laughs> so if you do try and define you know a fixed output we are going to get this result on this date and it's going to cost x i would basically stake my mortgage on you being wrong <laughs> it's just like it never happens that mm. way so it's a kind of false sense of confidence and security that a waterfall yes. methodology can can create i think that mm. you know okay great it's easy for us we can get budget approved for this because we're promising that you will have this output by this date for this amount of money whereas in reality that just doesn't happen yeah. if there's a lot of uncertainty mm or it's a new thing that's never been done before. So there are different types of projects where Agile really comes into its own and others where a, a more waterfall approach actually is fine and it does work. Yeah, and, and that's something that we, we do, isn't it? I mean, we're talking about yeah. Agile now, but that's kind of, for some projects, we've seen that work really well. But for others where, as you said, Laurie, the, the requirements are much more defined and in some cases, maybe actually our role in the project is not to creatively come up with ideas it's to implement things that have already been defined for example mm. in which case yeah maybe an agile approach is isn't right for each project we we think about what are we trying to achieve what does the client want what's everybody who's working on the project's understanding of agile or mm. of waterfall what works best and in some cases may even have different approaches at different stages of of a project yeah. um where different things are more or less important mm. yeah So although Agile is definitely our preferred approach, we don't always assume that it's going to be right for every project. And it's really important to discuss this properly before we start a project to make sure that people understand what it's going to involve and the level of flexibility that's required to make it really work well. Next, I wanted to get back into the practicalities of running an Agile project. So we wanted to talk about the Scrum framework, which is probably the most common way of implementing Agile. Can we, could we dial back slightly? Because we were talking at the start about like, what does an Agile project actually look like? You know, what's a typical week look like, for example? And we talked about the backlog and user stories and how we've got this you know, dynamic backlog, which ideally is developed based on our understanding of learners. But in a, in a Scrum process, which you mentioned at the start, Joe, is probably the most common way of implementing the Agile principles, and it's the one that we typically use. What is the actual process? How does this work? So I've got a backlog. Okay, that's my starting point. But what happens then? What's the kind of the cycle and the, and the processes involved? How does it work within a team? Yeah, so so if you're using Scrum, they talk about Scrum as having three roles, three artefacts, and four ceremonies. Mm. So, so the roles would be the product owner, and the product owner is is the person who is kind of setting the the direction so you might have that big list of stories in your backlog and the product owner is kind of the point of contact with the client or with the with the learners and using that understanding of the client and the learners to prioritize that backlog and set that direction the second role is the the scrum master who then clears the obstacles for the team is responsible for the scrum framework for facilitating that definition of what's in the sprint what people are committing to how much time that's going to take from different team members or how much time each story is is likely to take and then you have the third role is the development team so that might be actual software developers it might be content creators editors whatever yeah they're, they're the kind of three key key roles um, and then your 
the artifacts are the the product backlog, which we've talked about, this kind of wish list, the uh, sprint backlog, which is each cycle, the things that you're agreeing to commit to, and then the prototype or whatever it is that you're actually building or outputting. That may, I guess, in, in different projects, that kind of takes different forms, but the, the, the thing that you are incrementally improving. And then the ceremonies is basically it's meetings. <laughs> <laughs> ceremonies <laughs> sounds so much better. Yeah. So much more magical, doesn't it? Yeah, we don't yeah. have meetings, we have ceremonies. The ceremonies, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Get your robes on, some yeah, candles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Less fun remotely. But, um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so there's sprint sprint planning, which is where you look at the backlog and define what specifically is in the sprint. So you start at the top of the prioritized list and say, how long is this going to take? Who's it going to involve? Do we have time to do this? Does it need to be broken down in any other way? Or can we commit to this? Okay, yes, we can commit to this. Look at the next one down. Who's involved? How much time is it going to take? Can we commit to this in the sprint as well? Okay, yes, this is in. So your sprint planning session is you is, is you effectively making that commitment of what you're going to work through. Uh, then there's a, a concept of a daily stand-up or a daily scrum, which is um, should be really short and sometimes called a stand-up so that you're standing up so it's less comfortable so it does take less time um, but yeah. the idea is that you, you you describe what you did yesterday or in your previous period of work what you're doing today and uh, if you've got any blockers and what that shouldn't be is an opportunity for you to actually do the work if if some bigger discussion is needed then that should be taken out of that meeting and and, and the conversation had separately and then you've got the the sprint review where you look at what happened in that sprint so at the end of the sprint you come back together and you say okay we committed to this we worked on this throughout the week or fortnight what did we create what have we what have we got at the end of it mm -hmm. and then the last one is, is a retro um retrospective where you look at what you did do and again as a kind of learning experience actually say like what went well what didn't mm. go well what did we learn from this what did we learn about the process like did we estimate this user story completely wrong did we bring it into the sprint when actually we weren't ready what was there some background work that was needed that we didn't really realize and that is yeah a, a sort of opportunity for the team to self-evaluate um mm. that hopefully gives a bit of a sense of of the, the sort of key elements of it but i think it would also it's important to say as well that we we might not use that in exactly that way with every project so mm, it's yeah. kind of about at the beginning saying okay well do we have a product owner is that role who's that role being played by how closely do they need to connect with the client do we have a scrum master like, when are these meetings is it weekly or fortnightly sprint cycles etc so there's a kind of element at the at the beginning of a project of defining exactly how we're implementing that approach what what's interesting hearing hearing that and thanks for that joe that's really really interesting but, but one observation is that the way that that scrum flavored application of agile the way that that approaches and deals with uncertainty is actually through very rigid structure. Mm. Mm. Like, it's not a case of just kind of throwing ideas around and thinking about what's the next best thing we could do, what would be a good thing to do. It's like, it's actually very, very strict. Mm. And that's how uncertainty is mitigated or is dealt with and explored, exposed, and resolved. It's through structure, discipline, and repeatable processes which mm. I think is really interesting. And I think that's something that is often lost in the conversation around Agile, um, mm. where it's kind of like, you know, it's iterative, it's exploratory, it's experimental. It sounds very loose <laughs> when it's not. It shouldn't be. Mm. It should actually be really tight and disciplined. That's how you get through to a point where you, you've delivered something that's valuable. And sometimes you kind of hear that as a bit of a criticism of Agile. You know, yeah. like people think of Agile as you know, fluidity and, and, and being able to just respond to what happens and, and you're kind of not being restrained by, by process. And actually, that's not really what it is. It's you are really, really constrained by process. Um, it's just a process that allows for that uh, sort of emerging nature of the, of the project. But I think some, yes, yeah, we had discussions in the, in the team recently about like, well, what if you decide to do something and then you realize halfway through the sprint that it's wrong? Mm. But are you just then you just have to do it? Are you like kind of you know blinkered? <laughs> and you say, well, we defined it, we committed to it, we have to do it. So, and actually, I should say that some 
we're working with a project manager at the moment, Rebecca Thornton, who's helped us to kind of define a lot of this for uh, an internal project. But she was saying that you need to as well take a common sense approach to it, yeah. um, especially in the sort of work that we're doing. And I think even more so when there isn't a team of, of developers, but maybe maybe just generally, actually, you just need to take mm-hmm. a, a kind of common mm-hmm. sense approach to it. So if you do realise that something is just unmanageable or undesirable on day two of the sprint then you can kind of allow yourself to to change that yeah it's got to work for you and it, and you've got yeah. to feel comfortable working within it as well it's got to kind of allow mm-hmm. you that scope isn't yeah it? i mean i mean that is a common criticism of scrum but i think you know which is that it is too rigid and you may find yourself realizing halfway through a sprint that actually this isn't what we should be doing but we just got to do it anyway because a, a rule of scrum rule in inverted commas is don't change mid sprint but but again you know the whole point of Agile is that it is emergent and iterative and you know you are learning and improving as you go. So I think that that flexibility is key, but you do need a framework. But part of the goal of the team, this is what the retrospectives are for at the end of each sprint, is, okay, how can we do this better? Mm. You know, what's working for us in this process? What's not working? Okay, let's change it. Let's improve it. And I think it's also interesting to note, like, okay, you might realise two days into a two-week sprint that something's wrong, Mm. Um, but that's far preferable to realising two weeks into a twelve-month build that something's wrong <laughs> in a in a yeah, traditional two waterfall years approach. Into a project. Yeah, and be like, oh gosh, we have to stick <laughs> yeah. with this now for for that period of time. Yeah, this is completely wrong, and I don't want to go and rewrite my hundred-page specification document and get budget reapproved and go through six co- approval committees. So let's just let's keep just going. Keep, do it. Yeah, <laughs> which, or, which is what happens, you know crazy as it sounds or at the very other end where you say well you know what happens today will influence what happens tomorrow and then you end up with mm. so little structure i guess yeah. that it's yeah. hard to feel that you're being efficient in when working in that way so it's a kind of yeah a, a structured middle ground between sort of complete yeah. emergence where whatever you as a team feel like doing you can do each mm. day versus it's prescribed for you over the course of a six-month project and you're stuck with that whatever i mean what you want to know is that within any given small window of time you have an empowered team Mm. working on what they've agreed is the highest priority thing what's the most valuable thing we could be working on for our users or our learners are we doing that and if the answer to that is generally yes Mm. then you're probably in a fairly good place but if the answer is frequently well actually no for whatever reason either because like you said joe either you're changing your mind every day or because you're locked into a two-year fixed spec both of those are different extremes but the the problem is potentially still the same which is that we have a bunch of people not working on the stuff that really matters Mm, mm -hmm. i think it's important not to lose sight of that's what this is trying to facilitate Mm. is that we have a team who are empowered and highly motivated and have the skills needed and at any given moment, they are working on what most matters for the for the user. Yeah, and I think that at one end of that spectrum, you might end up, so the sort of waterfall end of the spectrum, you might end up with something that's wrong. But at the other end mm. of the spectrum, you might just not really end up with anything. You might just yeah. kind of go around in circles a lot and never actually produce something. So I think that one of the, 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 mm. the benefits of the process is that you're kind of forced to produce something that you put out there in the world, and then you get feedback. So it's not um, mm. sort of constantly hypothesizing about yeah. what might or might not be right but you've got something that you can put out there you've got some evidence and you can say okay based on that what do we then want to do over the next two weeks or whatever the sprint cycle is let's get a bit more backstory here we heard joe right at the start of this episode sharing the story of a failed project that he was involved in a while ago let's find out more about that and why that led joe to believe that Agile is the most effective way to develop a learning product. Okay, so Joe, where did your interest in Agile come from? Why did you decide that this was something you wanted to start using in the in your work? And by, <laughs> by extension, that then sort of spread throughout the, the whole LearnJam organization. I was working on a project in, I think it was 2000 and. 10, 2011. So obviously Agile was a thing then, but it wasn't something that we, we were using in, in the organization. It was a, a, a chain of a language schools and we were building some software to help people learn remotely outside of their classes. And we kind of defined a whole bunch of different online activities to build. And instead of doing it in a iterative, incremental way, we just 
were working on ev- everything. I think it was like nine different activities to all release at, at the same time. And we got about a month away from the, the launch date and funding for the project was cut completely. But we were, and we were so close to getting it out there. And then in the end, nothing was able to be released. So no learners ever saw all of this stuff that we were working on. And it just felt so sad. And, and the team, so there's a, a developer, myself as a kind of learning, learning design, learning expert, product manager, uh, and then a designer. And the three of us were so disappointed that all of that work that we'd done then didn't ever see the light of day. And at the time, I didn't think, I wish we'd used Agile, but then it was kind of after that, reflecting on it, and and I guess Agile was kind of gaining in popularity. And, and then I thought back to that experience and how different that would have been if we had said, let's just build one activity and get it out there and see what people think of it and learn from that, and then we'll build the second one. We were kind of too focused on, you know, a full launch of a complete product. So, yeah, I think when then going to, you know, product meetups and other sort of tech events and so on and, and understanding more about Agile, I reflected back on that as a personal experience and thought that things would have been really different if we'd been able to implement Agile there. So that's kind of stuck with me. And then I think mm-hmm. through other other projects, seeing it work, and, and in fact, you know, as, as well to say seeing it not work for some things, um, mm-hmm. but I think we've built up an understanding from doing that of where there are where a project it really makes sense to implement an agile methodology and being burned in the past and seeing it work <laughs> as we've gone yeah. through different projects kind of combined to to help me advocate for it yeah i guess we've all got personal experience of mm. being burned by waterfall projects in yeah, different yeah. ways but yeah, yeah. <laughs> sort of battle scars yeah mm. <laughs> that's right we've all seen and experienced huge amounts of wasted work effort energy time and money yeah. and nothing coming out of that or nothing useful coming out of that for learners mm. which is kind of criminal really isn't it you know, mm. <laughs> you know for that to be happening um, and that's happening a lot mm. you know, agile isn't it's not a silver bullet or a panacea it doesn't mm. solve that completely in every instance it's definitely a better way in a lot yeah. of cases Just to kind of wrap up this episode, Joe, have you got any sort of final thoughts or tips or suggestions? So, Mm. for example, if someone is interested in finding out more about Agile or experimenting with it or deciding to, okay, I want to adopt this. This sounds great. This is something I've heard about. I want to to see what the benefits are and try this out. Mm. What would be your advice? Whether you're able in your organisation to actually implement an agile approach or not, I think one of the key benefits that I think should be there, whatever learning product you're building, is to make sure that you are putting what you build in front of learners and getting feedback from them and learning from that during the process that you go through. And I think you don't need to have fully adopted Agile in order to advocate for that in your organisation. You know, how are we getting information from learners before a project? And then how are we getting information from learners as we work through a project about what what's working for them, what's not working? So I think that that would be a, a kind of key thing to try to do if you're not doing it. There's never a user testing session that we do where we don't learn something it's in it's and that's across whatever type of project if you yeah. take the time to talk to learners and to get information from them then um yeah it really helps helps the project so i think that would be one one piece of advice i think if you are thinking of implementing agile it's really good for everybody who's going to be involved in that process be on the same page so go through some some training figure out what that means why you're doing it make sure that everybody is kind of on board with doing it because i think that will then work a lot better and i think if it's not possible to adopt agile or maybe not desirable to adopt agile over your whole organization think of is there a specific small project or a section of a project that would work well or that we could experiment with this and then try and section that off and say okay for this bit maybe it's a discovery phase or a prototype build or something that's kind of slightly separate from your business as usual is there a way that we can set up an agile approach for that and see how it works and and kind of get get going and see see what comes out of it yeah i think that's good advice and i think in the spirit of agile don't overthink it and don't Mm. spend don't put too much time energy into trying to come up with a detailed plan for how you might implement agile which obviously, you know, would be quite Goes ironic. It runs yeah. completely yeah. cancer to the whole <laughs> spirit yeah. of it. Yeah. Don't just jump in and start doing it. Like you said, I think there are foundations you need to put in place. Like you said, there's different levels of experience or knowledge of what Agile is across a team. Then you need to sort that out. You need to get everyone on the same page. Mm-hmm. And I think also pick a small project or even, I think it's a really good suggestion, even a part of a project. 
Mm. Can we just try it with this as a better approach than let's try and implement a tiny little bit of agile across the whole organization? Yeah. 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 Pick a small bit of what you're doing, try and apply agile more deeply Mm. and pay lip service to agile across the whole organization at once, which I think is more likely to fail because you're not going to see the benefits and therefore you're not going to get the buy-in and the momentum that you need to, to show that this can actually bring mm. real benefits and help. And I think that as one of those ceremonies, those meetings, there is the, mm. the the retrospective. So you have an opportunity as a team built into the agile process to reflect on what's working and not working. So you can say, let's try it for a sprint. And then, you know, your retro might be quite involved that first time because yeah. there's a lot to reflect on. And there's possibly a, a lot of improvements or changes to make. But then um, it's good that there is that self-reflection built into the process to help you yeah. move in the right direction with it. Absolutely. I just want to chuck in one quick book recommendation. If you just want to get a very quick, easy to read overview of Scrum in particular as a, as a way of implementing Agile and in the process get a decent understanding of what Agile is and what the benefits can be. The book is by someone called Jeff Sutherland who is credited as the co-creator of Scrum and the book is called Scrum, the art of doing twice the work in half the time. If you're just interested in this in general and you just want a quick overview of that process and how it works and what the benefits can be, I'd recommend that as a good primer. Nice. Just to draw this ceremony to its uh, natural conclusion, I think it's just worth saying that if, you know, if you are a, a learning designer or working in a learning organisation and you just want to have a chat with us around um, what Agile might mean for you, for you and your team, we've spoken to a lot of teams and organisations over the last couple of years around Agile. Drop us a line at um, hello at learnjam.com. We'd love to hear from you and uh, we can start exploring that conversation with you. Okay, well, thanks for joining us, Joe. It's Thank you very a, much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, uh, well. Look forward to uh, welcoming you back. We might, I think we might do another episode on Agile. What do you reckon, guys? Yeah. Uh, there's more to explore. I think it'd be interesting to talk about some of the projects that we've done and what we've learnt and get a bit, a bit more specific. Mm. Yeah, interesting. It'd be great to put some, yeah, uh, yeah, let's, some flesh on this. Hold that thought. Great yes. stuff. Joe, lovely to see you, my friend. Thanks yeah. for this. Nice to be here. Thanks a lot. Take care, mate. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Adventures in Learning Design was brought to you by LearnJam. To learn more about what we do and who we do it for, and to download your own free copy of our learning design principles, head over to learnjam.com.